sermon on joy robbers. And joy, we talked about last week, is one of those things that becomes quite evident in a believer's life. It's one of those things that if you ever rub up against it, you, you kind of know what I'm talking about. It, it's, joy is hard to explain. Sometimes we, we uh, like to equate joy with, with happiness, but joy is much, much deeper, much more profound than just happiness. Because happiness, if you try to be happy, which by the way, God's not really concerned about that, but if you try to be happy, you're really going to live life on a what? A roller coaster. And it's, it's no fun. Have you ever been around people like that? It's one minute? Yeah, never mind. I don't want you to raise your hands because I don't want your spouse to hit you. But uh, anyway, I, um, I, joy is just, it's, it's something deeper, something that, it's a fruit of the Spirit. And when you encounter it, when you, when you sense it within yourself, when you sense it within somebody else, you, you just recognize it. And by that, for one of those reasons is that the enemy sees that also, and he wants to rob us of that. He wants to steal our joy. Because if we do that, then there's other things that take its place, like bitterness and anger and jealousy and strife and all of those things. And then what happens is we become like everyone else. Matter of fact, I said, all you have to do is jump on Facebook for the last two weeks and you can see all kinds of believers with their joy rob. You're just as angry, just as bitter, just as upset as the world is. And yet I think it's important for us as believers to manifest joy. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about what I consider to be the number one joy robber of all joy robbers and it's the past. So I'm gonna to talk to you about the past today. Now, if somebody were to come up to me, I, I don't know um, who it would be. Um, I'm just gonna pick on somebody here. Pastor Abe comes up to me and says, Shane, what, 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 what is your spiritual calling in life? Not only would I say pastor, but I, I would say this, and, and some of you in here would, would know what this means, but I also see my role in a certain way as being somewhat of a, uh, a spiritual healer of sorts, um, that I, I want to see people spiritually healed and, and set free from bondages so that they can experience the greatness of life that God has for them. And so I, in that role I, as, a, as a counselor, I have seen a lot of people over my years in ministry, from youth all the way up to senior adults. And it's amazing how such a little phrase, two little words, can rob our joy. Two little words, the past. How the past can steal from us, rob us of our joy. It's the enemy, I believe's number one weapon against us. And this is something that I would go back and, and I wish I could tell myself as a youth. Uh, this is something that you guys need to pay attention to. This is something all of us need to pay attention to is because nothing happens in secret. Do you know that? Nothing happens in secret. Not only does God see it, but our enemies see it as well. And as a matter of fact, he's taken record of it. So the past is always coming back to haunt us. Today, though, I'm going to talk to us about our past in two forms. One, a past that we want to forget. And then secondly, a past that we should forget. So I'm going to talk to you about that in two aspects. And I believe there's a, a really familiar passage of Scripture that talks about the power of this. But I want you to notice as I read this passage of Scripture that Paul is talking about something very interesting here. In the book of Philippians, he said he's concentrating all of his energy on one thing. So let's take a look at this together. I don't mean to say that I've already obtained, achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. But I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Actually, if we were to say it in, in, in the full terminology, it would say I would focus all my energies on this one thing. 
forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Now, I want you to know before I read the next set of verses that with Paul, he's always telling us to do different things. He'll tell us to put on, to put off, to stop, to start. And here he says what? Forget and what? Look forward. So Paul here is giving us a formula. Forget the past and look forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree at some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress that we've already made. Father, I come now and just ask that as we speak, as we talk, as we listen, as we hear, that, Father, you would begin to bring freedom, maybe some fresh insight. Father, I pray that for those of us in here that you have freed us from different parts of our past and all of that, and we're walking in that reality. Father, I thank you for the joy that is there. In your name I pray, amen. Now, before I move on to, the, to talk about the past that we want to forget, I want you to notice the power of those verses. So many times we just read over them so quickly. But what I want you to see is that he says here, not only should you concentrate all of your energies on forgetting and looking forward, the next verses implies that there's something forward to look forward to. Did you notice that? And then he uses very strong language. He says, what? That if you disagree with me, I believe God will change your mind. Now that's bold, but that is how strongly Paul felt about this. Now, Philippians is an interesting book. Philippians out of all of Paul's writings is probably his most personal, intimate writings to a church. So he's talking to a group of people here that he cares very deeply about, that he's being very open and transparent to, and he's giving them some fatherly advice. Forget and look forward because there are great things for you to accomplish in the future. And if you disagree with me, well, God's going to change that too. But keep looking forward, amen? Amen. So let's talk a little bit about this past that we wish we could forget. All of us in here have done things wrong, amen? All of us in here have had things done to us, amen? It's part of life, it's part of the broken world we live in. It's part of the choices that we make. Unfortunately, it's part of the choices that are made for us. And sometimes in this past, we carry deep trauma, deep wounds, and deep pain. Now, what I said to you a few minutes ago, I want us to remember is that these things are never done in secret, it never happens in private. Not only does God see, but our enemy also sees. As a matter of fact, if you notice one of the verses I put up here, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, our enemy's called the what? The accuser. The accuser of the brethren. Well, what is he using to accuse us? what we've done. And not only is he accusing us in front of the Father, he's also got a main thing that we all struggle with, that we all walk around with called the flesh. And that thing likes to remember the past as well. And so the past is always seeming to pop up. Have you ever noticed that you could be sitting down watching TV or be on your way to work and you're listening to the radio or maybe you're lying in bed at night and all of a sudden something that you haven't thought of in forever 
pops up into your mind. How many of you have experienced that before? Well, who makes that pop up? When, when does the past fly up in your face? Uh, one of the things that I had to learn on my own as I was walking through life, and I've shared with you a lot of my story as a very broken individual, is that I would be in random occasions sitting in random places doing random things, and all of a sudden the past would hit me like a ton of bricks. And man, at that point in time, I started questioning, am I even forgiving? I've repented of that thing thousands of times. I've, I've tried to move past that hundreds of times, just like a lot of you say the same things, and yet they keep popping up. Well, the reason why is we have an accuser, and he's constantly accusing you're not worthy, you're not good enough, you're broken. One of the main ones, you're not forgiven. You're still paying for this. This is too great a sin, you can never move past it. I can tell by the looks on your faces that you've encountered the same thing. And it's this accuser of the brethren that keeps bringing this junk up. But see, what the accuser does is not only does he bring it up, but what he also does is he brings up and he sticks. Have you ever noticed how he sticks the little lies in there? The little lies. And it twists it just a bit. Just a tad. Because see, those are his main primary two weapons. Matter of fact, Jesus calls him what? The liar. The liar. What we have to understand is our enemy is really, really good at lying. He's been doing it for eons, telling people lies. Much brighter people than myself. <laughs> much more gifted people than myself, much uh, greater uh, positions of power than myself, been telling these lies in such a way that we just believe them. We don't even question them. No wonder it says in 2 I mean, Corinthians chapter 10, it says that in order for us to participate in this spiritual battle that we are engaged in, because we're not fighting against people, we're, we're fighting against what? principalities. We're not fighting against flesh. And so he says that we must take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Why? Because the past is seemingly always there. Always there. You know, the Lord has blessed me to be able to work with, um, especially for a long period of time, with, with people in addiction. And you know, the interesting thing is with people that struggle with addiction is that the enemy trips them up two ways. Number one, they, they're striving in their recovery and all of a sudden they relapse. Why do they relapse? Because a memory gets invoked. An emotion gets invoked. The enemy brings up the past. They're not doing anything wrong in the current. Brings up the past to trip them up. Secondly, remember I said how he tells a little lie? Remember that part? Well, here's the little lie. He uses the word, you're an addict. I dare you to show me in scripture where you're defined after you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior as anything but a child of God, post-salvation. You're not an addict. You're a Jesus follower that struggles with addictions. I hate to tell you this, but every single person sitting in this room is an addict. 
Every one of us are an addict. We were created to be addicted to God. <laughs> but the enemy what? Perverts and twists, tells lies, brings up the past, makes us feel not worthy. Now what I want you to see here is, you know how everybody has a quote? This is my quote. This is my original quote. And this is so true, you should write it down, you should keep it in your Bibles, you should tattoo it somewhere. I'm just playing, those of you, just relax. But look at this phrase, because it's truth. The enemy uses our past to distract us in our present, to rob us of our future. That is what he does. He brings our past right up into the moment so that we begin thinking about it. And when we begin thinking about it, it also ties in with emotion because you cannot have a thought that's not connected to emotion and an emotion that's not connected to thoughts. And all this begins to happen. And before long, we realize how much time, have you ever sat back and thought how much time you spend thinking about the past? But yet all of that thinking, all of that worry, all of that anxiety doesn't change anything. Because the past is the past, we can't do anything about it. Jesus can, but we can't. So what does the enemy do? He gets us distracted right here in the present. And if he can do that, if he can distract us, he robs us of our what? Joy. And when our joy's gone, what begins to take place enters defeat, discouragement, shame, guilt. All of those things begin to flood into our souls when we let the past rob us of our joy. And the enemy knows this. That's why it's either his number one or number two weapon. Usually he combines them together. So my brothers and sisters, keep this where you can see it. Why? Because I guarantee you as soon as you leave today and you have a moment's quiet time in your head, what I'm talking about is going to come to mind. And the enemy is going to immediately combat it. Why? So he can distract you to rob you of the future that you have. The future in Christ. Doesn't Paul say, look what? Forward. Forward. Why? Because there's great things that God has planned for you in the future. Amen? So the question then becomes why we can't forget. Well, number one, I want you to know that it's humanly impossible to forget. We have this wonderful thing up here that records everything. I have one too, believe it or not. And it records everything but math and English and spelling. But I can talk to you about a Led Zeppelin song for those of you that know who that is. <laughs> or a U2 song. I should have put the two together, right, Doug? I should have put math and music together. Then I, yeah, hoorah. But anyway, it's impossible for us to forget. I can talk right now to you about your 12th grade year in high school. And your mind will immediately go, boom right back there. You can recall the school you were in. You can recall the classrooms you sat in. You can recall the clothes, oh Lord, that we used to wear back then. You can recall everything. We can't forget. As a matter of fact, I, I know that you're not going to believe this, but in the South, we take barbecue very, very seriously. 
And we know when there's a serious barbecuer, when they use real wood and real charcoal. None of this propane mess, no gas, but, but real wood and real charcoal. Why? Because if you're using propane and gas, you might as well just go ahead and put it on the stove. Never mind. Anyway, and you get all this smoky flavor. Well, I, my, my daughter and I, my, my daughter loves to grill with me. As a matter of fact, we have names. We've got Mac Daddy Steaks. We've got Mac Daddy Hamburgers. We've got Mac Daddy Chicken. We've got it all, right, Mackenzie? And the thing that she and I enjoy doing is we will get into the kitchen and we enjoy making our own marinades, our own seasoning, our own spices. And man, there's nothing like getting about a 10 to 12 ounce prime rib. I'm talking nice, marbling. And sit it down in that marinade and just rub it with the spices and let it sit there for about eight hours. While you're doing that, you go outside and you get the wood, you got the mesquite soaking and you get the wood and the charcoal going, you put it in and mm, you can just smell the smoke. And then you, we pull out the steaks. Right on the grill. Oh, you can just start to smell that marinade. You start to smell that steak cooking. How many of you are picturing it? Amen. All right. Yes, yes. Amen. I've woke you all up. Why? Because we have this incredible capacity for memory. Not only do we get a picture, but we can get a smell. We can get a taste. We can actually hear it in our minds. And I think I'm eating hot dogs after church. But anyway... It's all good. But there are, are, we, 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 we can't forget. We can't. Now, these guys down here will never experience this until about 20 years from now. But some of you can still remember your first kiss. Like I said, you guys, 20 years, <laughs> especially you. You can remember it like yesterday. You can remember your first love. We can't forget. So why does Paul tell us to forget when we can't? Interestingly enough, the Greek word here that is being used by Paul to tell us to forget has another word that I think is very, very interesting. We can't forget, but you can neglect. You can neglect it. Now, we are great at neglecting things, amen? That's why we put the dirty clothes hamper in the closet. <laughs> it's why we wait to the last minute to do shopping. It's, it's why we procrastinate when we know people are coming over for dinner and you wait to the last minute to do that. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You got homework due. You wait to the last possible minute to get it done. Yes, yes. And then all of a sudden, mom and dad need to come in and do your homework for you to save the day. Yeah, that's cheating, by the way. But anyway, we all do it. We all are capable of neglecting. We're all capable of it. We, we get up in the morning and, I don't know, Cliff, one day we wake up and say, you know what, I don't feel like shaving today. How many of you guys in here know what I'm talking about? Amen, amen. Shaving's rough on us, guys. Ladies didn't get that. But anyway, it's rough, we, but we choose to neglect it. We do have that capacity. And what I want you to see here is a hidden key to this passage of Scripture, is that your past is always going to be with you. The enemy is always going to remind you of it. Neglect it. Yeah, it's there. But I don't have to play with it. I don't have to go into that room. I don't have to enter into that memory place. I don't have to engage it. The reality is, is that it's already been dealt with in Jesus. Amen? See, we can't forget, but we can neglect. 
And my brothers and sisters, as I'm saying this to you, I can sit here and just recall my own past like crazy. If I let myself, I'll do the same thing you do and obsess over it. But you know what we have to do? We have to recognize that it's there. God gave us these incredible brains that remember everything that stores deep within us and connects to deep emotions and it is all there, but it doesn't mean I have to mess around with it. It means what I can do is every time that it comes up to mess with me is that I can say, Jesus, you told me to take every thought captive and this one keeps messing with me. What should I do with it? You've forgiven me for it. You've redeemed it. And somehow you're causing it to work for your good. As a matter of fact, Jesus, I don't even own it. You bought and paid for it. So I'm just going to leave it with you. Amen? Amen? Now here's the hidden secret to that. That I think we all need to get in our heads. Is that if we run to Jesus with our past, every time it shows up, the enemy is going to quit invoking it so much. Because the last thing he wants you to do is be driven into the arms of Jesus. Amen? Amen? All right. So we're moving along here. So this is the past that we wish that we could all get away from. And I want you to write this verse down. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, uh, Isaiah is talking, he's being led by the Spirit, and he says here, he says that there is no weapon formed against us that can prosper. Now, this ties directly to the verse in Revelation because that word weapon, we often, guys, we often think of guns and swords and spears and all of that kind of stuff. It's really not. It's actually uh, an argument, a reasoning where it almost plays out like a courtroom drama where the accuser is standing before God and, and he's accusing us with an argument, with a presentation. And what is being said here is that none of that, none of that can prosper. None of it. If we let it go. If we let it go to Jesus, amen? Are you with me? Because this is important. It's not yours. You're bought and paid for by Jesus. He now owns it. Give it to him. And what? These things the enemy keeps throwing our way begin to lose its power over time. It begins to lose the pain over time. And before long, it's just an annoyance. Amen? Amen? Ready to move on to the next one? Because I'm going without you, even if you are, aren't. A past... We should forget and neglect. Now, I've chosen every parent's nightmare here, the movie Frozen, to prove a point. How many of you hear that stupid song in your head? Let it go, let it go, let it go. I wish the radio stations and Disney would let it go. I, oh my goodness. I don't even have a child that appreciates Disney and she's, Let's it go, right, Mackenzie, sometimes, every once in a blue moon. Anyway, she's going to kill me for that. So let it go. So there, there are th some things in our lives that we want to get rid of, but we struggle getting rid of it, and it robs us of our joy, and it robs us of our future. But what I want you to know in context here is I want you to see before these verses, when you go home and have time, to read the verses ahead of the ones that we read, I want you to look at the things that Paul listed off. As a matter of fact, it's an impressive resume. It's impressive all the things that he did. And it's out of that context that he says, for all of these things, I concentrate my energies on one thing and that's forgetting my good things. <laughs> 
my pedigree. And I'll reach forward for the things that are ahead. My brothers and sisters, this is something that we do not like to hear. There are good things and traditions from our past that we have to let go of. I'm talking us as individuals and as a church. There's things that we have to let go of. Because if we do not let go of them, we cannot go into the future of the things that God has for us. And what begins to take place, I personally believe, is the worst curse that can be put upon a church. And it's apathy. It's what Revelations describes as lukewarmness. Not really hot, you're not really cold, you're just kind of apathetic. And God's response to that is pretty graphic, isn't it? It makes me want to what? What? Vomit. It's kind of like eating lukewarm green beans from a can. Nasty. Now you got that image in your head. There you go. Apathy equals lukewarm green beans. So don't be a lukewarm green bean. Anyway, but there's things that we have to let go of because if we don't, we will find ourselves living in the past, celebrating past accomplishments. And what begins to take place is we begin to be apathetic about our current situation. We're now being distracted and all of a sudden when we should be filled with joy as a church and as individuals, when we should be overflowing with what God is doing in us and around us and amongst us is replaced by Jesus, I love him. I think Tom's only got two more songs planned and then I can sit down. This is incredibly inconvenient. We begin to focus on, not on the words of the song, but, wow, that's a little louder than I usually like it. See, that's apathy. Somebody just turned me off. (laughs) Mark? (laughs) But it's apathy. We, 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 we lose the very thing that attracts people to us, and that's joy, a vibrance, a life. Some churches are, and some people are convinced that the only way to move forward is to repeat or stay in the past. We've all seen it. We've seen churches and where people have a lot of promise, and before you know it, they're down to 40 and they're the only ones going to heaven and everybody else is going to hell and they don't care. Do you know what really, one of the deep things that I struggle with, and I'm I'm seeing it right now back in, in, in my home country, is a number of people that are inconvenienced over a stupid flag that just want Jesus to come so they can get away from suffering. That is so stupid. Don't they realize that there's billions of people that don't know Jesus yet? That are really suffering? Really hurting? Really inconvenienced? And it's not because of a flag? But yet because of our apathy and complacency, we begin to to shrug our shoulders. Doesn't really bother us. We get stuck in the past of thinking, you know what, we got to keep singing the old ones, those oldie but goodies. We got to keep, you know, somebody needs to go out with their cardboard sign in their box and stand up on the street corner and yell and scream at people as they walk by about how bad they are and the fact that they're going to roast in hell. If the church still did that kind of stuff, could you imagine the ineffectiveness that 
how ineffective we would be? Are you following me? Yes? Have you ever... Now, look, don't get me wrong. I love the old hymns. So don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. But I, I want you to hear it from a new person, a person that's lost, that comes into our church and the only thing that they can sing or relate to is a fountain filled with blood. You guys really are crazy. Are you with me? I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm trying to be honest. We have to find ways to re-describe this good news, amen? Because isn't it still good news? Some of you are looking at me kind of angry. Jesus will forgive you. I'm not trying to be offensive, but what I am trying to say is this, is that there's things that we, yes, we want to hold on to, the incredible works that God has done. As a matter of fact, when you look back in Scripture, how does God encourage his people? It's by reminding them of the good past, that God will still do great things in the present, that he will deliver in the future. So I'm not saying we need to let go of all those things. I'm just saying we can't hold on to them to the point where it becomes a ball and chain where we can't move into the future. Because Dalhousie, I believe this in my bones as much as I believe it or I would not be here that our future as Dalhousie's greatest moments is still ahead, not behind, but ahead. It's okay to amen that if you want. If you don't believe that, then Jesus will tell you you're wrong. But anyway, it's the point that we have a great future ahead of us. And if we're not careful, we can get so caught up in the past. Have you ever sat down with someone and the only time that they can tell you about their Jesus experience was 10 years ago or 15 years ago or five years ago and you want something current in, in, in right now in the moment and, and they can't. Why? Because the enemy's robbed them. He's got them living life back here as it's still happening, not realizing they're missing all of this that could be happening. I hate that guy, don't you? We don't want to be those kind of people. We want to be the kind of people that says, hey, this is what Jesus did in my life this last week. This is what Jesus did for me today. This is a person I encounter. How many of you are with me? Amen, amen. So what I'm encouraging us to do is this, is the past that we wish we could forget is to realize it's already been dealt with under the blood of Jesus. It has already been redeemed by him. He owns it. The next thing that I would like for us to remember is this, is that there are some current things that we need to let go of, but the reason why we have a hard time letting go of it is because of emotion. the feel good or the false guilt. If we feel it, it therefore must be what? True. But yet, I don't know if you know this or not, but your emotions can lie to you. They can. And emotions are tied to thoughts. Do you know and and Brother John Taves back here, brother, you could probably say this better than me, so if I mess this up, forgive me, okay? I'm going to try here. That deep within us, the way that God created us is that as thoughts enter into our minds, left unchecked over a period of time, they become what I call core values or core thoughts. Are you following me? And they become deeply enrooted in us. That's why it's so important, Scripture says, watch the words that come out of your mouth. Because you have the power to what? Bless or to what? Curse. We see it all the time. People struggling with their core issues. Why? Because there's these core thoughts down here that invoke very powerful emotions. And it always seems to keep coming up, good or bad. But what has to happen is, is we have to take all of our thoughts captive 
and then replace them with new thoughts. But the thing is, is it takes time for the new thoughts to get all the way down to replace the old thoughts. Am I doing okay, Brother John? I'm sweating up here. Wow. And it's so important for us because when somebody is raised with low self-esteem, who has been verbally abused and they don't feel worthy, it takes a long time for the truth to get in there to do what Jesus says. The truth then eventually begins to what? Set you free because then this other one begins to move out and you give it over to Jesus. My brothers and sisters, I think all of us in here, whether good or bad, whatever past we're talking about, the one we should let go of or the one we want to get let go of, is we have to check what these thoughts are. And we have to replace them with different thoughts. Amen? And the one thought that I won't replace in Dalhousie is that our greatest moments are ahead of us. It's not in the past. So let it go. Let it go. (laughs) Okay. All right. So there's a bit of advice here that I'm, I'm going to play for you. And it comes from an unlikely source. How many of you know Bob Newhart, the comedian? This video that I'm about to pray for you has a lot of truth in it. And so I want you to, to watch this and hopefully you'll be able to hear it and everything and then we'll, we'll finish out. But this is an incredibly uh, powerful moment. Bob Newhart is playing a counselor and the woman that's in there is seeking his advice on a certain issue that she has. And so listen to what Bob's advice is for her. About the problem that you wish to address. Oh, okay. Uh, well... I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. (laughs) I just, I start thinking about being buried alive and I begin to panic. Has, has, has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No, no, but truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house, anything boxy. So what, what you're saying is you're, uh, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes. Yes, that's it. All right. Well, uh, let's go, Kazan. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Shall I uh, write them down? Well, if, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most We find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, here, you're there. Stop it! <laughs> I'm sorry? Stop it! Stop it? Yes, S-T-O-P, new word, IT. So, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. <laughs> stop it. So, I should just stop it. There you go. I mean, you, you, you don't want to go through life being scared of being buried alive in a box, do you? I mean, that... Sounds so frightening. <laughs> yes. Then stop it. I, I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since no, childhood. No, 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 no. We, 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 we don't go there. Just, just stop. <laughs> Practical advice, amen. Oh, come on now. You know that was good. So here's some practical things that I would like to to leave you with this morning, in dealing with the past. And I would write these down somewhere to keep them in front of you. Remember that the accuser equals liar. That when he comes accusing, remember he's always lying. Because if you're sitting here right now and you have named Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, 
All of that stuff has been forgiven and dealt with, being redeemed, being used for good. And anytime he brings it up, he's trying to make you feel false shame, false guilt. Why? Because he's the accuser, so realize he's lying. He's lying. So the accuser equals a liar. The second one is truth versus emotion. Remember your emotions will lie to you. Somebody believes me. Emotions will lie to you. Have you ever got up one morning and somebody says, you don't look so well? And you think about it during the day and by the end of the day, you're sick as a dog? <laughs> don't let your emotions lie to you. The truth combats the emotions. So dig into God's word and let the truth set you free. This is really important. Sometimes we, we have things in our lives, and I personally believe I've got people that I talk with that we need just to get it out of us. How many of you know what I'm talking about? We just have to drag it into the light. In Galatians, it talks about this. It says that, that the Holy Spirit shines the light into all the dark places, all the dark corners, so that everything can become clear or light. Sometimes it helps to talk about it. My brothers and sisters, I believe what Larry Crabb wrote, he said that 90% of all the things that believers struggle with can be helped by one another and just leaning on each other, talking with one another, supporting one another. So talk about it. So you can go to someone who can remind you about forgiveness. Now, this is incredibly important. Um, the church has lost the power of, of this, I really believe. Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, wrote a brilliant book, a small book called Life Together, a wonderful book. And in there, he's talking about the power of forgiveness, the power of the word coming from a brother. And do you know we all know that we are ambassadors of Christ, right? Well, imagine the power of that when you have someone sitting with you who has been beaten up by their past and you're able to look them right in the eye and say, Jesus loves you. He's forgiven you. The past doesn't define you anymore. Jesus does. You shouldn't feel the shame. You shouldn't feel this false sense of pain. Let it go. I don't know if you've ever experienced that before, but I have. And I can tell you, well, any shame, I bawled like a baby because I realized that by speaking it and in hearing truth in return, it helps set some shackles free. Amen? The next thing that you should look is you need to have somebody that's going to look at you and tell you to stop it. So when the apathy sets in or the complacency or the, the grumpiness and the joy is gone and they're focused too much on the past that they used to have or whatever, whether it's the past you want to forget or the past you should forget, the past you should neglect, or want to neglect and the past you should neglect, sometimes it's really good to have somebody look at you and say, I love you, but you need to stop it. Stop it. Amen? It's practical advice, right? Now, if you were to watch the rest of the video, he actually says, stop it or I'm going to bury you alive in a box. But anyway, don't, don't threaten people with, with that. But church, I again want to say to you, even with all the laughter and everything else, that this is one of the enemy's top two weapons. To make a struggle personally and to make a struggle as a church. And to combat that, we need to constantly be bringing these things before Jesus so the truth can set us free. Amen? And my brothers and sisters, no matter who you are, where you are right now, 
I want you to hear this truth. There is a great future for you. There is a great future for you. There are things that God has planned for you and you alone to do. So whatever is holding you back, good or bad, let it go. And step forward into that, amen? Let us pray. Father, I come before you right now and I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you that in a very deep subject, we can still laugh and and cut up. But Father, I, I thank you that you have said that if we are your disciples, do what you tell us to do, we will come to know truth and truth will set us free. Father, I pray this morning that right now that the Spirit would take these seeds that were talked about this morning and, and bury them deep into our hearts, into our souls, that they would take root and bear much fruit in our lives. Father, I pray that as Jesus talked about the birds of the air coming in and stealing seed, that that would not happen here this morning, that, that those who are here this morning that have needed to hear from you about this, that, Father, it would find fertile soil and they will come to know freedom. Father, for those that are here this morning that need to speak with someone, to just get it out in the open, Father, I pray that you would give them courage. Father, I pray that you would give them peace, that this is what you said in James. Chapter 5, you said, let us confess these things so that we can find healing. And then the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. So Father, I pray that there would be deep ministry taking place. Father, lastly, I pray that starting with me, but all of us in here, that we would be convinced that our church's days, our best days, our brightest days are ahead of us. And that we should concentrate on this very one thing, neglecting this past and look forward to what you